I feel the liftoff. The clock has started. Roger. and welcome to another episode of the Punk Rocker Moon Stomper podcast. And we are in person this time, which is so much fun. I am one of your intrepid hosts, Amy, and with me in person. I am the other host, Jason McClellan, and we have with us a guest, as we always do, but our wonderful friend, Jeff Notkin. Greetings, comrades. Thank you for joining us today, Jeff. Thank you for inviting me. I know this it's been a long day. Fun. We are at Space Fest right now. And uh, you've been busy hawking your wares, and it is an exhausting task, I know. It, it, is, it is exhausting. I don't want you to really present me as some sort of a hardcore <laughs> salesman, though. I, I think I spent most of the day setting up the booth and dealing with technical issues. Right. But we, we, did, a, we did a bit of show and tell with customers late in the day. Good. Even though we weren't officially right. open, it was because, the art opening. <laughs> because at the end of a long day of dealing with technical issues, setting up a booth and all that, you want to be dealing with sales right that's that's where you get all your energy no i got all my energy thinking about doing the podcast with you two heroes <laughs> all right so but thanks nice try <laughs> I'm trying. um all right so why don't we let you introduce your own self and tell us what it is that you do i'm doing this podcast with you Let's oh, talk, a proper let's talk, one. Let's talk about oh, yes. let's, a proper maybe, one. Maybe let's okay. do. Oh wait, we didn't do. Hang on, because we are, we're, this is our like non regular format, and also it's ten o'clock at night. <laughs> um, we have to do the introductions of what we're drinking. Yes. Um, I am drinking something that's like a cucumber thing that the hotel makes, and it is delicious. Um, I don't know what's in it, but it's tasty. That is an amazing introduction or, yeah. or description, and you don't have to say anything more. That's I want it. a delicious cucumber thing right it's now. A that sounds really something. good. Mm. It's so refreshing. Oh, I like. Cucumber, that's yeah. great. Well, what are you drinking? No, Jeff? you go first. All You're right. The host. Well, I will go first. I'm drinking a Sam Adams because Sam Adams is a great brewery and they make all sorts of wonderful things. But it is the summer and uh, they make fantastic summer ale. So it's got lemon in it, a nice uh, light drink for the summer. So Sam Adams summer ale. That's what I've got. Uh, you could do ads for Sam Adams. That was really well done. I would Sam like Adams to. Summer ale. So I'm drinking. It's not quite as exotic, although it's also quite unusual. What appears to be just Pellegrino, or Buongiorno, nice sparkling water in a, in a bottle, is Pellegrino, but I also put my secret vitamin cocktail in there, which okay. doesn't contain anything illegal, but it was to give me a little extra sparkle for the uh, show good. after my taxing day. Good. Excellent. Good. I like it. Like so it. custom drink. Custom cocktail. Custom cocktail. I like it. I, I, I made it myself. It's, I didn't <laughs> get it down at no hotel bar. Fantastic. Yeah. Look at that. You can tell that I'm in television, can't you? Because I just instinctively, instinctively turn the label change. away from the camera. <laughs> yep. It gets so drilled into you. Turn the label away. Yep. Put, tear the labels off. Turn the label away from the camera. Unless you're getting paid well, for it. Well, we are independent, right. so yes. label, label the camera. Yeah, label, label the camera. Label yeah. the camera. Yeah. Label, yeah. The camera. I label do it. All label that it. TV, I don't TV believe knowledge. in labels. We're alt, non indie, alt. <laughs> oh, Scar golly. wave number four. Yes, yes, that's coming. <laughs> so they say. I know. Okay, so I'm supposed to introduce myself. Introduce My yourself. name is Jeff Notkin. I am a British expat. I grew up in London, England, and I now make my home in the glorious and weird city of Tucson, Arizona. I am a science writer, a television host, film producer, and a meteorite specialist. And rocks from outer space have been my passion since I was a kid. And I, I've done a television show about it called Meteorite Men for three years. Went all around the world searching for space rocks. And I'm the president of Aerolite Meteorites Incorporated, which is a commercial meteorite company. And um, in order to fund my, what's a polite word for addiction, uh, my passion for <laughs> meteorites, in order, to, uh, in, in order to fund my enthusiasm <laughs> for meteorites and expeditions to find meteorites and write books about meteorites and make television shows and films about meteorites, I have a commercial meteorite company because... All you academic purists out there will agree with me that expedition and research money has to come from somewhere. Yep. And we'd rather not resort to crime, so we have a commercial meteorite company, and funds from that go to support our nonprofit, the Science, Arts, and Space Institute, and expeditions and educational work, and publishing of science books. 
And that be my story. And that be why we love Jeff. Also, he's just rad. Also, oh, another thanks. way I can tell that you're like honed into TV is how good you are at looking oh, directly thanks. at the camera. This is great. Yeah. Um, I've just cheat yourself a little bit. <laughs> cheat yourself. Cheat yourself a little bit. Oh, I know. Put all these instincts down. Which, yeah. For those of you <laughs> listening to the audio version, check out the little bit of the video so you can see what Jeff looks like on camera and how very honed his skills are. I say thank Mr. you, Mr. Television <laughs> Star. But I think oh, that about wraps it up. I don't, don't think we can do it anymore, so we might as well so call this show? an episode. Yeah, we're done. No, that was really good, though. It was um, a great show. All right. I did all the talking. Yeah, no, I mean, I, we, we can't we can't do anything after that. Okay. No, I mean, I think we should probably, because your story is a fascinating one, and there's so much to talk about here. Um, let's, you want to cover want space first, because say, there's do we interesting... Wanna, do you want to start with space, or do you want to start, like, let's literally start with, through Let's life. start with space, right. because the other stuff is, like... Mm -hmm. I think naughty. It is. It is. It gets a little <laughs> naughty. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, it's a little off the beaten track for for normal interviews. Um, you know, related to Jeff's work. So, roger to that, sir. All right. All right. So let's talk space for a bit, and let's go ahead and well, first, I mean, you mentioned that you developed your love for meteorites as a child. Like, how did that come about? Like, what what was it that made you just decide that I'm fascinated by rocks from space. Yeah, not rockets. Get it? See what I did there? <laughs> yeah, the, Bad that, pun, it's late, that, I'm sorry. That, that too, that too late. <laughs> I, did, after I did actually have an epiphany. It, it, was, it wasn't a slow build. But the groundwork was laid because I, I was fascinated by rocks and fossils. As a little kid, I was always out in the woods in the house, uh, behind in the house. I was out in the woods in the house. I was out in the woods behind the house where I grew up in South London. In, in the quarries and looking for rocks and fossils. And my dad was a very keen amateur astronomer. Okay. Uh, and it's lucky he was a very patient guy because being an amateur astronomer in South London just doesn't really add up. So you've got a lot of clouds, lots of gray rain, and then the lights from London, it's not so great. Yeah. But every now and then it would be clear and dad would set up his telescope and you know, look at the sky and get excited and come and wake me up in the middle of the night. And, and there are many instances when I was a little kid of being wrapped up in a blanket and carried outside to our garden and he'd hold me up to the telescope or put a stool when I was a bit older and look through. So some of my earliest memories from childhood are looking through my dad's telescope going, ah, oh, you can see the rings of Saturn and wow. the moons of Jupiter. And I, I found this an astonishing experience that from a garden in, in a fairly well-to-do suburb of London, you could see other worlds in space. Yeah. So this fueled science fiction and when I was a kid, Doctor Who was airing, Lost in Space, Star Trek, Prisoner, Thunderbirds, all this great stuff, all late 60s shows. And so I grew up watching that. So astronomy, rocks and fossils, science fiction, and then we've got the space program happening as well. So I was eight when, when Apollo 11 uh, mission took place, the first moon landing. And I like to say that I was born in the year that the space program started for real, 1961, which also explains a lot about my life. I'm as old as the space program. So all of this, sci-fi, space program, I was allowed to stay home from school to watch the Apollo missions. My parents would write a note to the headmaster saying, Jeffrey is staying home from school to watch the moon mission. Which doesn't sound like anything today, but in England in the 60s, at a really strict, yeah. you know, British public school, proper school, or a tie, and stupid cap and all that, <laughs> staying home to watch the moon landing. I don't understand that. But it just added to me being teased mercilessly at school. So anyway, really long answer to your question. So these are all the things I'm interested yeah. in. And Star Trek's on TV, and Lost in Space is on TV. And I hated school. I hated going to school. So strict and stuffy, we had to wear these stupid uniforms, these ridiculous little beanie caps. I was 13 years old, I'm still wearing shorts to school, like, you know, some sort of, I don't know, yeah. convict. <laughs> Except you have to wear shorts instead of a jumpsuit. So I would, I would beg my parents to let me stay, let me, I have feigned illness, I don't want to go to school, I hate school. And my mom would sometimes let me skip school and she'd take me to the museums in central London, mm. Kensington, West London. Mm -hmm. Science Museum, Natural History Museum, Geological Museum, loved all of this. And I would go and look in the cabinets, the minerals and the fossils, and be astounded by the, not just the, the specimens themselves, but the care with which they were curated. Mm. I loved the collection numbers and the labels and all the little things and the cataloging and how they were arranged. I was fascinated by all this. And then behind 
the big hole of minerals is the hole of meteorites. And it's this little dark hole. It was, it was as if it was kind of, oh, the cast off, oh, the meteorites. Go stick them <laughs> in that kind of in the like unpopular, bad, yeah. far eastern wing of the mineral hole. And there it's just this dark dome room. It's full of meteorites. And that was it for me. I go, well, here's everything I'm interested in. I probably didn't, didn't intellectualize it quite like that, but in, in hindsight, everything I was interested in. So here's rocks and fossils. Well, not fossils yet, but believe me, they're coming. Uh, rocks and astronomy together. And they got here almost by science fiction means. They have visitors from other worlds. Yeah. I was transfixed as a kid. And then at that time, there's no subculture of meteorite collectors. The, the comparatively small number of meteorites that were known were all in museums and universities. So I promised myself as a kid that one day, I somehow, by some means, would acquire a meteorite. Mm -hmm. And my first, one of my first missions along that route, was probably about eight, and we were vacationing in the States on Cape Cod. And I went out in the sand dunes and I dug this hole in the ground and I found some ashes from a barbecue or something. I threw them all in the bottom of the, of the hole and go, it's a meteorite crater. And at the time, we now know this is not the case, but at the time, like everybody else, I thought meteorites were hot when they landed and they would yeah. burn the ground. Yeah. So, so, that, so that was how it all started. It was to, I remember very clearly seeing these big meteorites for the first time and they had these fantastic shapes and these things on them that look like craters. And I thought, gosh, not only does it come from outer space, it really looks like yeah. it came from outer space. Yeah. It doesn't look like it belongs here. And maybe there's something to that too, because I sure didn't belong in the school that I went to or the neighborhood that I grew up in. So I may have felt like a bit of an alien visitor myself. Maybe that's why there's a bit of a oh, simpatico camaraderie there. We're all cast offs, <laughs> you know, celestial rubbish thrown out into space. and landed here. So longest answer in history, probably to one of your questions. No, I like it, it's fantastic. It lays the groundwork, I like it. But I know you and I have talked about this before, but you know, it's it, now hearing your, your initial love for fossils and meteorites, um, I'm curious to hear your I don't know, I guess your initial excitement or, or interest in things like the, the Allen Hills meteorite, mm. you know, where you have the possibility of things like fossilized diatoms or things like that. So for, for the viewers, Jason's referring to ALH84001. It's a meteorite that was found in 1984 in Antarctica, in Allen Hills in Antarctica. And when it was taken back to the lab and examined and under an electron microscope, there is a shape in this meteorite that some people interpret to be fossilized bacteria or something. Yep. And it surely looks like a, a, a worm, a wormish yeah, thing yeah. When, if you look at the photograph. So there are quite a few different schools here. Some say it's proof of alien life and some say it's not life at all. It's just a, a weird shape in the rock. And some say that it was life from Earth that somehow crawled into yeah. the meteorite. So. Whichever story you believe, well, I shouldn't say story, whichever theory you support, it still was very exciting at the time because it looked as if there may be proof of life in a meteorite. So uh, as is so often the case in science, uh, the majority has not been able to agree, really, on a particular thing. No. Although I think most meteoritists probably lean towards feeling that it's not mm -hmm. uh, a fossilized anything. but. Let, let me just make it perfectly clear that there's going to be fossilized something sometime, yeah. probably soon, I think, the way the Mars exploration is going with the robots there. And you know what I'm talking about. Mm. We've seen these amazing photographs showing water, uh, sorry, the results of, of the motion of water on Mars. And when I see these photographs posted on Twitter, from, from our, uh, my friend Tanya Har Harrison or someone else, I typically tweet back and I go, where are my stromatolites? Or the stromatolite fossils are just down in there. So stromatolites are uh, ancient algae colonies. They're one of the most primitive types of life on Earth and they, they still exist in a few places on Earth. And they're a very good candidate for uh, possible, if life did exist on Mars or elsewhere, it's an early evolutionary form of life and so that's would be a reasonable type of fossil to expect to find. 
It's one of the most fascinating conversations I've had with somebody about this topic it was with a, a gentleman named Richard Hoover, and he established NASA's astrobiology program. Ah. And he is firmly of the opinion that there are many meteorites uh, uh, that show fossilized diatoms, and that was the bulk of his personal research was diatoms and you know these algae, um, and he could distinguish what you, you know what these things looked like in a fossilized form, and he was confident that even images that were taken on Mars showed that. Uh, you know, they were seeing these things on Mars too, fossilized life forms on Mars. And um, he tells a story about how these things were, you know, get into conspiracy theories here, but um, NASA actively, in their story is they tried to, you know, remove these things or something, but intentionally destroyed with lasers or cutting tools or whatever, um, these fossilized life forms. And he is firmly of the opinion that we've found this many times over. Mm. And, oh, interesting. you know, since then, NASA's, of course, distanced, distanced themselves yes, I from know, him. Yeah, I, but I, uh, he I firmly stands by it. And, you know, he was certainly of sound mind enough to lead their astrobiology program and work in this astrobiology field for decades. Yet when he, you know, asserts something that he is certainly qualified to make a, a claim um, then all of a sudden he's a lunatic. Uh, it's, so. it's interesting how that works, isn't yeah. it? So were you here at Space Fest last year? Yes. I, I can't remember. I thought yes. you were, were you at the Apollo panel last year? Yes. So I had the great honor of moderating the Apollo panel last year. It was one of the highlights of my career, I must say. So I was on stage with eight Apollo astronauts, mm -hmm. I think we had, I think we had I last so. year. So the panel ran 90 minutes and it was, it was packed. So there was standing room only, there was, uh, best audience I ever had for anything I've ever done. And quite close to the end, I, I, had, a, I had a special question I've been dying to ask the astronauts. And, and I had a year to prepare. And the, the Apollo panel happens every year at Space Fest, and it's a big deal. And I wanted to ask them questions they hadn't been asked before, unusual questions. So towards the end of the panel, I said, gentlemen, I'm going to ask you a question now. And I don't want you to think about it. I want, I want you to give me an instinctive answer, gut reaction. And if the answer is yes, I want you to just put your hand up. Um, the question was, do you think there is some form of life elsewhere in the universe? And, and all but one put up their hands immediately. And I really? said, I think these gentlemen are better qualified than the average person to answer this question. Do you remember who didn't raise their hand? I do, but I don't want to get in trouble. Because <laughs> I do like him. We just have a difference of opinion. That's, that's fascinating. I, I, remember, wouldn't, I wouldn't was, expect that. I remember you asking that question. That's interesting. And I, and I yeah. followed up by saying, I'm not talking Star Trek level civilizations. Yeah. I'm not talking about starships. I just something. Microbes. Algae yeah. mats, yes. trilobites, yes. ants, yes. something. And probably not even remotely similar to what we expect. And. I am, I'm a great fan of the Canadian biologist Karen Bondar. I, I, I really like her work. She did, she did a great web series about biology. She's, a, she's a, a ballet dancer turned biologist and television host. And she came to Arizona and did a, did a presentation at the Science and Astronomy Expo. And I got up and asked her a question and, and we got into thing because I, I said, you so often hear people talking about the Goldilocks zone and how conditions have to be just right for life and it's probably very rare in the universe. And so we were talking about this and I said, have you not seen Star Trek ever? Because in Star Trek, which is based on a true story, as we all know, based on a true story, there are rock monsters like the Horta and there are all types of life that have evolved so wacky, so different from what we expect that I think we should have broader expectations of what life might be like out there. It's not going to look like us. Oh I yeah. Don't think. Oh yeah. No, I mean the looking at astrobiology as a whole, and and then looking at habitable worlds. You know, it's I I don't know. I, I find it hard to believe that one person wouldn't raise their hand. You know, with the possibility of some form of life. But uh, you know, especially with all the, the exoplanets and exomoons and everything that we know that exists now, but our own solar system, there are so many habitable worlds 
in our own solar Agreed. system. Mm -hmm. I, um, I would like to ask about the rock on the table and also ask that you describe it in proper meteorite terms for the people that are not watching the video. Oh, versions. with pleasure. Because it's, yeah, go, just you go. <laughs> just go. You okay, go. proper meteorite terms. Yeah. This is an iron meteorite. It is a complete individual. And that means that this specimen flew through the atmosphere, our atmosphere, as an autonomous, complete individual. And we know that because it is covered with surface features that were formed during flight, during ablation. And these indentations, these little crater-like forms, are called regmoglypts. That would be a really good one for the spelling bee. <laughs> <laughs> And they were created when the surface briefly turned molten and, and, and flowed across. Mm. And some of these features are probably also uh, were caused by weathering on Earth. So this was once part of the molten core of a large asteroid, probably a main belt asteroid between Mars and Jupiter, and was probably thrown out into space as the result of asteroidal collisions. The core cooled wandered through space for perhaps millions of years, and then encountered our atmosphere. And some audience members will know the difference between meteor and meteorite. So I was just going to ask you that, because uh, even, you know, among, among <laughs> journalists here, um, you know, you see in mainstream media, always seem to have a problem yeah. with this. Yeah, yeah. So if you would walk us through, you know, what are meteorites, meteors, asteroids? You With know, pleasure. So. All right, so asteroids, fragments of rock orbiting the sun, most of them between Mars and Jupiter, forming the asteroid belt. Most meteorites that we have on Earth originated from asteroids. So when a fragment, when an asteroid fragment is hurtling through Earth's atmosphere and the air around it is incandescing, forming a shooting star, that is a meteor. And if part of that survives its fiery journey, lands on Earth, it becomes a meteorite. And just to confuse everyone a little bit more, there's another term, and that is meteoroid. So the meteor, in strictly scientific terms, is the atmospheric phenomenon created. So it's not strictly accurate to say the thing in the air that's coming down is a meteorite. It's really a potential meteorite. Yeah. But when we're describing a fireball or a piece of asteroidal debris in the atmosphere that we later recover, we go, we know it's going to be a meteorite, the fireball that made the meteorite. So that thing, that rock, as it enters the atmosphere, is a meteoroid. Meteoroid. Asteroid fragment hits the atmosphere, incandesces, shooting star, meteor, lands on Earth. Meteorite. We got it? Got it. Space rock. <clears throat> space rock is a much easier way of explaining it. At this and point, space rock. A couple more facts. This fell to Earth about 5,600 years ago. It is called Campo del Cielo. It was found in Argentina. And it is one of the oldest known meteorites on Earth because it was first discovered by the Spanish in 1556, 1576. Wow. 1576. And uh, iron was quite valuable. Pure iron. Look at that. Pure iron. We don't have to smelt that. So I don't know if it was, if anyone could possibly have speculated that it came from the sky. It's doubtful because in the 16th century, the official position of the Vatican was that meteorites did not exist mm -hmm. because God created the heavens, so the heavens must be therefore perfect. And if the heavens were depositing stones that fell on the earth, they couldn't be perfect. And so the official Catholic Church position was that meteorites did not exist. So was the, that was that still before the uh, when we were in the era of the crystalline spheres too? That I don't know. Mm. When was Tycho? When did Tycho see his sublunar lunar comet? So why I think it did was... meteors not exist? Because I remember, I'm sorry, did you completely derail you? I apologize. No, no, it's fine. This is like way, I mean, you know, uh, Renaissance era, I don't remember the dates off the top of my head, but like 14, 1500s, um, the 
each planet orbited in a sphere. This is, I forget whose view this was, but it was, they were in these crystalline spheres, so they couldn't move, so that kept the orbits. So no meteor could exist because they would shatter the crystalline spheres. Ah, I, and that I was did one because that. that was one thing that I thought was the most. Not that I make sense to say that like, oh, the heavens are perfect, therefore there are no meteors um, or asteroids or anything that's not a planet. But I thought that was so interesting that like, no, it's because it's ordered in physical structure, so you can't have that because it would break it. Ah, that's Physically intriguing. Break it. Oh, I wasn't familiar yeah. with that. Huh. So there, there is no disputing that rocks fell out of the sky and landed on Earth, and, and the Enschersheim meteorite from the mm -hmm. 1500s, uh, 1400s, 15th century, is a great example of that, because it's a large meteorite that still exists today, although a lot of its mass was chipped off by souvenir hunters even then. And so all sorts of theories were cooked up about what these might be, and a quite popular one was that they were thunderstones, mm -hmm. and that thunder and lightning yeah. in the atmosphere somehow caused dust to congeal into rocks and then fall, which hmm. is kind of a colorful theory. I quite, yeah. I quite like that. But it really, it really all became, uh, it could not be argued anymore that meteorites didn't exist after the Legla fall in, in rural France. And uh, this 19th century fall, and there so many hundreds of meteorites fell in the daytime or witnessed by so many people mm -hmm. that it just couldn't be disputed anymore. And, uh, and a, a French a naturalist was dispatched to the scene to collect specimens and describe them. And his specimens are, can still be seen in museums all around the world with his beautiful labels and his hand his handwritten notes. Bio, B-I-O-T. Mm. Uh, naturalist turned meteorite hunter. Mm. It's quite, quite a good story. So... So this thing... Oh, go ahead. No, please. I was going to ask, this thing is, what, like four, five? I'm very bad. Five inches across? kind of oddly shaped. How much does it weigh? I want to say, oh my God. <clears throat> I want to say like 35 pounds, 30 pounds. I thought you were a weightlifter. I have, n I have no, I'm really bad at this. <laughs> I, what, how much is this? Is this way, is, I, is it because I'm so tired that this feels like it's way heavier than it really is? <laughs> yeah, probably. So I think it's, uh, it's, I think it's only about Twelve pounds, really? ten to twelve no, pounds. No, it feels I'm exhausted. Then. Well, we'll we'll weigh it later. <laughs> Perhaps the weight of we the have, world is just have, laying heavy upon we you. We have the peanut Perhaps. gallery in the corner over here laughing at me. It's really only I, I'm wiped. That's so much heavier than I thought it was going to be. Are you feeling? It's it's also pounds? confusing because this material is so dense mm -hmm. that it feels a lot heavier than it should be, and it's almost mm. as dense as lead. It's an it's a nickel mm. iron alloy. Right. So that makes me want to ask you a question about um, like bolides or you know fireballs that uh, burn through the sky different colors like the green ones. Ah. So what does that say <clears throat> about their their physical makeup? Excellent topic. I I do a lot of public speaking and a lot of exhibitions and gem shows and things as you know. And something that happens quite frequently is that people come up, they'll be very excited, they go, I saw a fireball in 1987 as I was driving through Connecticut yeah. and it, it landed just over there and how do I find it? So it's one thing if it was recently, but I, I love the enthusiasm of people and they think, well, there must be a kind of complete repository of all sightings and all information yeah. ever about meteorites and fireballs, which we wish there was, but the... The fact of the matter is, if you see a very bright fireball and it appears to land nearby, and we've all seen this, I'm sure, you go, ah, it lands, ah, it's just right over there. What you're actually seeing is a fireball arcing over the horizon. It's that far away. Mm -hmm. So the color is indicative of the material of which it's comprised. And the green fireballs are sometimes satellites burning up because mm. copper wiring uh, burns green. And I saw a That's really awesome. good one from downtown Jersey City yeah. when I lived in New York. And I was walking by the river and there's a lot of light there. It's New York City, you know, it's really yeah. bright. And I saw this green streaking fireball go right across the sky and I thought, space junk. So nice. we don't find copper in yeah. meteorites, and there are other things that would cause a green issue, but uh, m most fireball reports, people say they're 
white or yellowish orange or, mm -hmm. or towards red. But when when people tell me their fireball stories and they tell me that they saw green, saw a burning green, they're very excited. Maybe it's aliens. <laughs> no, it's probably satellite. Yeah. And there's always a bit of disappointment. Yep. And I think seeing a satellite burning up is pretty amazing. It is. But yeah. I think it's perhaps to non-space fans, maybe mm. it's not as astounding as, oh, it's not actually alien stuff. Yeah. It's just something we put up there that's coming back down and burning up. It's almost just like rubbish. Yeah. I could barely even bring myself to watch it burn up. Yeah. Yep. I forget the website, but there there is at least some tracking now oh, or, yeah. or, or some database of fireballs. No, but you're absolutely correct. So there's, there's Meteor OBS and of course there's the Meteoritical Bulletin which publishes all known meteorites. But I mean, the guys will tell stories and they'll go, yeah, I think it was like 1987 yeah. or maybe 89. I can't remember, it was coming back from the game and mm -hmm. I was in Massachusetts or Connecticut or something. And, but it went right over the highway. Somebody <laughs> must have found something. And they're right. so kind of insistent. No, no, but it was so bright you should have seen it. Well, we can't remember what year it was, or what state it was in, or right. which direction it was going, or what time of day, except it was dark out. Well, let's now transition. We'll use that as a, as a segue. You mentioned asteroids. And you, are you still involved with Deep Space Industries? I am. All right, so Deep Space Industries, you are on the board of directors? I am on the advisory board Ad of Deep Space Industries. Advisory board and Deep Space Industries, for those who aren't familiar, um, among other things, is a, a company looking to mine asteroids, right? Mm hmm And more. It's a very, it's a very exciting time to be a space enthusiast. Yeah. And we grew up in the era of NASA, and we all love NASA, but NASA's not funded as, as well as they once were. I, I wish they were, but they're not. And so we're seeing a, a very obvious shift towards private commercial yeah. exploration of space and space tourism. So DSI, Deep Space Industries, is uh, one of the furthest along in most exciting projects, I think. And I was invited by Rick Tomlinson, who is one of the founders, mm -hmm. to join the advisory board because meteorites come from asteroids. So if we look at meteorites, we learn about them, we discover what they're made of, we can get some pretty good indications uh -oh. of what the asteroids might be like when we get there. And so, briefly, the, the DSI plan is to send small robot ships out to the asteroids, and, and we can start with with the asteroids that come closer to the Earth, to NEOs, and don't have to go all the way to the main belt, to, to scout for asteroids that have materials that we could use. So when you say that, a lot of people think, oh, so we would go to the asteroids and get the gold and platinum and all the good stuff and bring it back to Earth. No, that's not the plan. That would be difficult and expensive. The plan is to go to asteroids and get goodies from them and use those goodies to do bold deeds in space. So if we can extract metals, which we can, well, we've virtually got the technology to do it. Micro foundries in space, 3D printing. You get the bits that you need from the asteroids. You 3D print parts that you want. You can build anything in space. So a more immediate need is water and oxygen. Because, as you well know, both of you, being spaceflight enthusiasts, everything that goes to the ISS has to be blasted into space. Mm. At, and it costs $10,000 a pound to send things into space at the moment. So all the water that the astronauts drink on the ISS and all their food and spare space helmets and cameras and all the stuff that they use, that all has to be blasted up into space. So if we could extract oxygen and water from the asteroids or the moon, should be pretty easy once we get there, those products could be used to supply the space station and other colonies. And the part that I really like is that if you were 3D printing stuff in space and building things in space, the spaceships don't have to be aerodynamic anymore. Yeah. They're never going to go to the atmosphere. Yeah. So we can finally make ships that look like the cruisers in Babylon 5 with the really fantastic <laughs> fronts and the bit that spins and all the big cannons everywhere. You could do that. 
it wouldn't have to land. Yeah. <laughs> so now we're we're this we're this close. I love I, I just absolutely <clears throat> love the idea of the space gas stations too. It's brilliant. It's so awesome. So it's a very it's an enormous shift away from from the 1960s concept of space travel, which is we you know we we take everything up there and we build a moon base and hopefully we can extract some stuff from the moon and build more things. You get everything you need from the asteroids to yeah. build virtually everything that you need, and a lot of the grunt work can be done by robots. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I, it's very far along. Yeah. I, I think we're going to see this in well, not very many years. That's the thing that I, I don't think a lot of people understand that you know even companies like Mars One and these you know companies that, the private companies that are out there talking about these elaborate plans of of colonization. They're not talking about futuristic technology. They're talking about technology that exists today. Yeah. It's just a matter of implementing it and you know making it happen, executing that plan. I. It's really exciting to watch all of this, and so many of the great developments and innovations have been made in the private sector. And when the private sector is doing stuff, there is not an unlimited budget. Yeah. It's it's got to be financially viable, and hopefully even commercially successful. So I'm, I'm very excited to witness it and I'm very excited to be part of it. And, and what a journey for me from kid staying home and watching the moon landings and, and staring at meteorites in the glass cabinets going, oh, one day, to, to being an advisor to DSI. I'm on the board of directors of the Astrosociology Research Institute and I'm on the board of governors of the National Space Society, which was founded by Werner von Braun in 1974 and is the largest grassroots space advocacy group in the world. So I wanted to, like many of us, wanted to be an astronaut when I was a kid, and uh, I didn't quite make it. There's a lot of math apparently involved, and also discipline, it's two, not two of my best subjects. But I get to hang I out think, with astronauts I think all, all, all three of us have been stymied by that. <laughs> <laughs> math. Yeah. So, so that's what we want to be mining. Although, really, the, the asteroids that produce uh, the, the, some of the, the darker asteroids that produce meteorites that we call carbonaceous chondrites mm. <clears throat> could be probably more useful because we've recovered a, a number of meteorites on Earth that contain water. So we know that some asteroids have water. It's not we think there might be some there. If we get meteorites from the asteroid belt and there's water in them, there's water in the asteroids. And maybe there's oxygen too, but at least we could we could we could make we could easily make oxygen from the bits that we need. Such an exciting thing yeah. because we've learned. I mean, <clears throat> when we look from an astrobiological perspective, you know, the thought is looking for life as we know it. You know, where there is water, there is life, and we found that water is plentiful in space. How about that? So <laughs> I, that's just incredible. We're gonna find life very soon. I know. Yeah, I I expect to. I, I know this, some people are going to poo-poo this, but I really expect, sooner or later, evidence of fossil life on Mars. Not dinosaurs or primates. But dinosaurs just are totally very, on Mars. Very, you think so? I think so. Ah, well, maybe. But I something. think they're there today. I mean, they went somewhere. They're just hiding. They like, washed it off. Well, to escape the asteroid That's right. impact. That's right. That's yeah, a good theory. God, it'd be a good science fiction film. Dinosaurs on Mars. Yes. It sounds like the I next like Roger it. Corman film. Love it. I will so watch that. Dinosaurs yeah, will, on Mars. Would, yeah, Dinosaursonmars.com. Get it quick! <laughs> Dinosaursonmarsthemovie.com is probably someone's already gotten that. We should talk about that. I think we can make that happen. <laughs> All right. So we've talked about space rocks. I love We've talked about rocks. Now let's, let's talk about a, a rock of a different, different variety and talk about your, your history as a rock star. Good grief. No, nice, you nice got? segue. <laughs> you, you are a rock star in many senses, but let's talk about, about music because, uh, you know, uh, uh, something that's near and dear to our hearts on this show is, is punk music, and you mm. are, sir, a punk rocker. I am a punk rocker. And, Look at uh, my hair. So, <laughs> yeah, let, yeah tell, us, tell us a little bit about your punk rock history. <sighs> well, my history is quite colorful, and as, as you both know, I went to school in South London, and when I was 10 years old, I met this strange boy, and he was into comics, uh, as I was. And there were 860 boys at my school, and there were the two of us who were into comics, and our, our one other friend, Dave Dixon, three guys, comic book fans. And so we, we gravitated together, and we hung out together all the time, and we would, we would get in trouble for reading comics at school, and 
we would escape from school and sneak up to central London and go to the one store in all of the UK that sold American comics at that time in the 70s. And my friend was all, is always reading. He's always reading these hefty science fiction novels. And many years later, he became one of the most famous living writers in the world. And his name is Neil Gaiman. You might have heard of him. He did a little comic book called Sandman and a little movie with Robert De Niro called Stardust and a little show called American Gods. It's on stars right now. So Neil's my oldest friend. We're still friends, still great friends. I saw him a couple of weeks ago, actually, up in Mesa. And Neil really turned me on to rock and roll music. So I, I'd, heard, I'd heard some music, but he turned me on to Lou Reed. In fact, he took me to my first concert when I was 15. Wow. We went to see Lou Reed the New Victoria in London. My first concert. Can you imagine seeing Lou Reed? First concert, 15 years old. That's pretty rad. He walks on stage, Ohms with Sweet Jane. And that was the great band. That was the rock and roll animal era. Uh, Prakash John on bass, Steve Hunter on guitar. Killer band. My life's changed forever. <laughs> that Within that first minute of seeing him, yeah, cranking out those chords, those Sweet Jane chords. Lou Reed in the 70s with the leather jacket and the sunglasses and the curly hair everywhere. <laughs> so, so after this, <clears throat> Neil says, well, we've we got to start a band. I didn't, I didn't play an instrument. He goes, we've got, we got, we got to start a band. It'd be a good way to meet girls. So this is 1976. So it's a year before the I punk revolution. I think that's revolution. how most bands started. Well, that's so, a good reason. Yeah. He was right. Yeah. Yeah, he was right about a lot of things. So he was, he was totally into Lou Reed. I was a David Bowie fan. He turned me onto a lot of stuff I, I didn't know. Iggy Pop. So we're listening to all this proto-punk stuff. Mm -hmm. Iggy and the Stooges, you know, yeah. my favorites. Bowie, Lou Reed, New York Dolls. And we started this kind of glam band. Mm -hmm. And he said I should play the drums because I was good at hitting stuff. <laughs> we, we used to argue. He was a DC Comics guy. I was a Marvel guy. <laughs> and we used to, we didn't, we didn't, you know, we used to yeah. shove each other. Going, oh, you know, Fantastic Four is better than Justice League or whatever. <laughs> so he goes, Do you, you play drums, you're good at hitting things, and then you won't hit me, hit the drums. So... I convinced my parents to let me have a drum kit and I, I put on a pair of headphones and I listened to Ziggy Stardust, Spiders from Mars, about 15,000 million billion times and played along with it and that's how I learned to play drums. Awesome. Woody Woodman Z, who later in real life became my actual drum teacher. Wow. So I learned playing along to Woody Woodman Z and then incredibly enough, Neil is friends with Woody Woodman Z somehow. He knew Woody, David Bowie's drummer, so I was at drum lessons. So we started this band and we did a few gigs and then I went to see this band. Guy, my friends go, you gotta go see this band. They're playing this little pub in London. It's like nothing you've ever seen before. So I remember going and waiting outside and I got my long hair and I got my baggy jeans with studs on the side, kind of totally like mid seventies look, what we would think very square today. And go into this club and these three guys come out, these three skinny guys, in jackets and ties and everything, Rick and Backer guitars. And they, go, oh, I do, do and they just blast through the sets about 35 minutes long. They do about 11 songs and get off, and that's it. And it was the jam. It was a very early jam concert, and I, I it was like someone had taken a hood off my head. Yeah. And I just, my life, absolutely, the direction of my life mm -hmm. was changed forever. And I go, this is it. This is it. Super high energy music. The guys dress really well, bouncing all over the stage, political stuff. Cursing, bad language, gah, mad energy. So that was early 1977. And it was all punk rock for me after that. So I went to every possible concert that I could. I was so, talk about being in the right place at the right time. I was in South London in a band, 1976. Wow. And then so we just went to every concert. Yeah. Clash, Buzzcocks, Ramones, Vibrators, all of these great bands. There was always something going on. The Stranglers, the Dictators. The American bands came to London. The Ramones and the Dictators and Blondie were more popular in the UK than they yeah. were here in, yeah. in, their, in their home country. Johnny Thunder's Heartbreakers, all of this great stuff. So my poor parents, I would, I would get the, the music paper, weekly music new, newspaper every week and, and, and look at the gig listings and the problem was deciding which concerts to go to. Because <laughs> you go, look, Friday night, so Stranglers nice are playing at the Roundhouse. 
Clash are playing at yeah. the Rainbow, Jam are playing at the Marquee. Which gig are we going to go to? Yeah. And I would have gone out seven nights a week for two or three years wow. if I could have. Yeah. But my, my parents did put something of a curfew on me, so I probably only <laughs> went to about 100 concerts a year. And after an incident at a, at a gig we're doing with the band, Neil and me and, and Graham Smith, our, our bass player, and, and Baggy, our... Our guitarist, who was one of the first casualties of rock and roll from my generation, is sadly long gone. Uh, somebody threw a full can of beer and it hit Neil in the head, cut him quite badly, and then he had a bit of a meltdown and he kicked in all the lights, smashed all the lights <laughs> out on stage. Yeah, and it's very punk rock. And yeah. so then I, we called the ambulance and I helped him into the ambulance and he went to hospital and had stitches and he goes, yeah, this rock and roll thing's not for me. But it was too late. And then he decided, crazily enough, to pursue a career as a writer. Right. He was moderately successful with that, I think. But for me, no, it was rock and roll. It was so... Uh, after I joined a uh, London band called the Marines and played the London circuit for a couple of years and then I moved to Boston played the Boston punk scene for one year met this crazy character this sort of hippie punk hybrid called Latch in Boston and he goes yeah I'm really from New York I don't like Boston we've got to go to New York and play in the New York punk scene so we left Boston we went to New York and we started a punk band and I played all through the 80s New York punk scene CBGB's wow. Cat Club Mercury Lounge all that stuff so for so I, I played I played rock and roll nonstop for about twenty five years wow. I would say and I, I started as a drummer but when I moved to the states I decided my real calling was bass guitar I mm. loved the bass guitar and also a big show off and sitting at the back of stage wasn't really working for me oh, I want to be guy, up there you know doing the power chords and all that and then somebody said at some point you know if you wanted to do power chords you should have been a rhythm guitarist not a bass player so you can't really do power chords on the bass but I don't really care and <laughs> the bass has only got four strings so it's not it's not that difficult really <laughs> And you should say, have been more assertive because, yeah. you know, drummers can, you know, like you can move the riser and like be front and center, like yeah, it was elevated weird, above though. everywhere. Like some, some, some clubs I've seen have drum risers that are incredibly tall. And I know at a venue I used to own, we built a gigantic riser and wanted to like elevate the drummer. So, so I did, I, I, I liked some heavy metal a bit. I went to heavy metal concerts as an experiment and I went to see Richie Blackmore's Rainbow okay. and Cozy Powell was the drummer and he was, talk about show offs, he's a great drummer, he's a big show off. He had drumsticks the size of chair legs, but his, <laughs> His drum, his drum riser was on this giant kind of elevator gantry thing, and it actually went up in the air and yeah. came out over the audience. Yeah. I go, wow, that's yeah. that's the way to get people to watch. No, but I wanted. I mean, kidding aside, I wanted to. I wanted to jump around. I wanted yeah. to do backing vocals. Yeah, and I. It's a very interesting experience for me, having been a drummer and then switched to bass guitar, and that. So I knew what the drummer was doing, and yeah. I always worked very closely with my drummer, but the. I was super lucky to have played in London, Boston, and New York punk scenes in, in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. And, and met, I mean, virtually everyone. The Sex Pistols, The Clash, The Ramones, Blondie. Well, or a, few of the, a few of them were really good friends of mine. Billy Ficker, the drummer from Television, a very pivotal band, I'm sure you know. He was my drummer for, for many years and I did a couple of albums with him. And uh, I, I was very friendly with with Pete Fenton, who was the original bass player for, uh, original guitarist for Susie and the Banshees. And when I was thinking about you two today, and I, oh, they're gonna ask me some questions about ska. And when I, when I, look, when I look back at those years, one of my very few regrets in life is one time we're in my, my own little rehearsal space with, with Graham Smith, my bass player, is in London, so I'm still playing drums, and Pete Fenton from Susie and the Banshees, and we're just jamming and having fun, and, and Pete goes, we should start a ska band. We should form a ska band. The three of us, and I go, ska, I don't like ska, I don't want, I don't want to do ska. And now, I'm mad for ska now, and I look back, I go, I could have been in a ska band with Pete Fenton from Susie and the Banshees. Ah, well. So, uh, most, mostly punk, mostly yeah. punk stuff. Yeah. The, I, I worked with Latch, the crazy guy that I met in Boston for, I don't know, 15, 20 years, all through the New York scene. We did a few albums together, and he went in a little bit more of an acoustic folk direction. He's the only guy I know in the world who's managed to get a word added to the dictionary, and that word is anti-folk. And he invented the anti-folk sub-genre wow. because he got thrown out of the New York Folk Festival for for playing electric, trying to do a Bob Dylan. And he goes, well, to heck with this 
New York Folk Festival. I'm going to go have an anti-folk festival in my apartment. <laughs> and it grew into an international movement. So that's how you start your own music scene, apparently. I like it. Mm-hmm. So you still play music? Do you still I play do. punk? Yeah, I, I'm not in a working band yeah. anymore. I, I do the occasional gig here in Tucson. I've played at the Rialto and Club Congress. So occasional charity concert. And I... I uh, my house is still, I've got all my guitars and all my basses, and I still write and record. You still play Rickenbacker? No, I right. sold the Rickenbacker because I fell in love with a Steinberger bass. Okay. And that Rickenbacker was such a great bass, it deserved to be played, and I sold it to a lady in New York City who fronts her own band, and she still plays it to oh, this day. Awesome. I didn't want it to end up in a case in storage or yeah. on the wall. That's a great bass needed to be played. No, I am totally a Steinberger nut. I've okay. got two Steinbergers that's uh, made out of mostly graphite, weighs four pounds, never goes out of tune. Great piece of gear. You need to get one custom made that's got a meteorite in it. Some sort of inlay. That is actually a really good idea. Yeah. So I, I did have a friend of mine make a meteorite pick, a okay. guitar pick for oh, me wow. out of meteorite iron, which is pretty fancy. <laughs> but I'm always losing my picks, yeah. and I kind of was always afraid that one day I might just throw it into the audience yeah, exactly. and go, oh, yes, yeah. $500 pick. Uh, <laughs> bring that back. Stop mm-hmm. the gig. Mm-hmm. Bring that back. No, that's a good idea, though, yeah. the inlay. Yeah, that'd be really cool. So yeah, I still I still love the music. the The reason I'm not I'm not in a working band is because television and bands, that's not going to work uh, for me. Because I go at it. It could if the right network were to give oh, you the right yeah. offer. So if we could do an on the road thing yes. about my meteorite band, yes. my band playing meteorite guitars on the road, <laughs> there there could possibly or be a you're hybrid. Or a touring there. musician who is also out exploring for meteorites on your gigs. So, like. yeah, sort of late for sound check. <laughs> yeah. you know, we're we're in the Sahara. There is a Martian meteorite fall. Yeah. That was actually, that's what was happening in, in the later days of the really? band in New York. So that's amazing. We, in, in 97, Latch and I recorded our second album. It's called Blang, which is my favorite of our records. And as soon as we finished recording, I jumped on a plane and flew to Chile, where I met Steve Arnold, who became my co-host on Meteorite Men. Mm-hmm. And we went on a screaming three-week expedition across the Atacama Desert. So straight from wow. recording a poke, whatever, p- poke, <laughs> punk folk album to meteorite hunting in the Atacama and, and that happened for quite a few years and it was just too much. And yeah, I, I felt sure. like I wasn't doing e- either job quite properly. So I, I semi-retired from the music business. Yeah. I'm not fully retired. Let's, well, that's let's good. No, keep, keep it that way. If anyone has the right yeah. offer and I, so Graham Smith who is a fantastic musician who now is a television producer in the UK he was the bass player in the Neil Gaiman's band, okay. Neil Ga- Neil's and my band, which was originally called Chaos. But then we discovered there was another band called Chaos, and they were really severe-looking guys, and we thought they would beat us up. <laughs> so we changed <laughs> our name to the X-Execs. The X-Execs. Okay. So Neil Gaiman, Graham Smith, I've said this before, but I hereby challenge you on this podcast to do a reunion. And since our guitarist, Baggy, has moved on to another dimension, I think we should get Brian May to play guitar for us. I, I think like that'd that. be perfect. Yeah. So Neil Gaiman, Brian May, Graham Smith and me, XXX Reborn, that'd be massive. We could like do that. an album and we can use meteorite picks. I like that. Yes, <laughs> meteorite picks. Yeah. It's a good, good, I like it. Brian May's an astronomer, he's perfect for the band. He'll do it, he'll do it. Of course he'll do it, I'm sure Of course he will. Him. All right, so we ask all of our guests on this show the same question, so we will pose that to you right now. Is it a bad one? It can be bad if you want it's it to be bad. a great one. No, it's fantastic. Go on then. So, and, and you will love it. Um, given the opportunity to travel anywhere in our solar system, the oh. technology's all there, so don't worry about logistics or anything. You can oh, go so anywhere can in the solar system. Where would you go and why? That is a super question. I love it when I get asked questions that I've never been asked before. Well... The first thing that came to mind, I'm not saying this is my answer, Mm -hmm. the first thing that came to mind is I would like to see the rings of Saturn up close. So so 
one of Saturn's moons, maybe. Although, if technology was not an object, what I I would I would like to travel through Saturn's rings. Nice. Mm. But also, as I believe you know, I I the 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 greatest honor paid to me was the Minor Planet Center named an asteroid Notkin, and it's one three two nine zero four. And I would really like to visit my own asteroid. That would, makes sense. I would like to go there in a little ship. It's a fairly big asteroid. It was discovered by Rob Matson at Mount Palomar. And I would like to land on that asteroid and get out in my spacesuit with my own little flag. And this is one of the few times in life you could actually do this. I get out with my flag and the flag says knock him. And I go, I claim my asteroid in the name of myself. And leave that flag there. Okay, that's what I'll do. I'll go see my asteroid. I like that. It's, it's, a really it's good answer. not too megalomaniacal. No. Okay, good. It's no, right no, it, it totally, it totally makes, <laughs> right makes sense. Level. I mean, it's already named after you. So. Yeah. Well, it could be. I mean, it's almost rude to not go if it's been named after you. I think so. I mean, if they gave you, it'd be like somebody giving you the keys to the city, and you're going, "Well, I can't be bothered to go try the key." That's right. Oh, it's just rude, isn't it? <laughs> All right, it's yeah. good. So perhaps because I'm one of your more difficult guests. Maybe we could kind of do like a slingshot thing. We go through the rings of Saturn, and that's the that's the short feature. That's the warm up, the you know the warm up band, the opening act. We do a big loop, and then we come down. We land on one three two nine zero four, and I do my my little prince thing. I take my watering can, and maybe there's life on my asteroid. Maybe we could do a little digging. Mm -hmm. Smell the dirt, asteroid dirt. Yeah, it smells like carbon something, carbon footprint. Oh, tiny All diatoms. Right. All right, let, let's wrap this up here. Now becoming talk about a, you're, Scott. You're, you're becoming a pain know. in the asteroid. We're going to have to bring you back. It's <laughs> yeah. okay, been, no, it's be been back. too long a day where I think we're all... Okay, yeah. so we'll do Ska next time. Yeah. I love we'll it how the, uh, the, the older person of the, the three here is the one with the most energy. Who's that? Who's the older one? Well, probably me, but... Here's, this is the old one <laughs> here. It's the old got, one right there. It's got tons yeah. of energy. That one went to bed a long time ago. So. All right, so when I come back on the show, I'll tell you the story about my Chinese martial arts master and how he <laughs> was fascinated by the energy that he claimed lived inside meteorites. And he's a smart guy, four degrees. I would like to hear that very oh, much. I know you would. Yeah. Where, okay. where would you like to direct people to go on the internet to I find say. more about you? Well, thank you so much. Aerolite Meteorites, my commercial meteorite company, we got two websites. So we have aerolite.org, A-E-R-O-L-I-T-E. -E, and that is our flagship website with all the information about meteorites and the expeditions and all that. And aerolitemeteorites.com, which is a mobile friendly site. So you can nice. uh, scan through it on a cell phone. And on the social media, I'm um, everything at Jeff Notkin. G-E-O-F-F-N-O-T-K-I-N. -I, I love Twitter. I'm a Twitter guy. You already know that. We love know. Twitter yeah. as well. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Check out my Jeff Notkin YouTube channel. I have a, I have a show called Meteorite Minute, which is a, we did a mini season of 13 episodes of short films with me doing funny accents and talking about mm -hmm. space rocks and even a bit of expeditioning and metal detectors and, and all that. So yeah, do a search. I'm easy to find. I'm friendly, I do my own social media. So, if you enjoyed the show, or if you're disappointed that I didn't do any accents, apart from that one, and a little bit of Italian on the Pellegrino. I think you did a lot of accents on this episode. Put, put in a, oh, I did a bit of London East End as well, didn't I? Yeah. yeah, down a pub. All right, so maybe next time we'll do the Russians and some the old minor 49er I think we can guy. get into that. Yeah. And I will say, Aerolite is a very cool company and you've got very cool t-shirts, just so people know. Oh, and I should just draw attention to my meteorite bolo yes. tie, which I wore specially. This is actually its debut. That's awesome. Love I was going to wear it at Science March, but it, I was standing on the stage facing into the sun <laughs> when I spoke at Science March. Blind and, people. Uh, yeah, that's I, and yeah. we were filming and I thought, that's going to burn out the lens on the camera, it's yeah. so bright. So this is a Canyon Diablo meteorite from Arizona. Well, and it's certainly fitting for Tucson, so oh, mm -hmm. I like it. Thank you. Well, ladies and gents, you've both been friends for many years. It is really a treat to A, be on the show, but B, most importantly, seeing you two doing in something person. together. Yeah, yes. In person. Yes, really fantastic. Yes, this doesn't happen that often.
So, I know. So we're excited to finally have you on, and we'll have you on again. We'll Fantastic. definitely have when you back. When we have more energy, oh my God, why? for sure. So, yeah, it's not even that late. I keep no, it's the not. Clock. But it's not again, we're at a conference, so kind of exhausting. It's been long days. But uh, Jason, you can always your... follow me. Uh, website acentric. That's a c e c e n t r i c dot com, and that's the same for Twitter. Um, also, check out RoguePlanet.tv, All sorts of interesting stuff about space and UFOs and aliens and fun stuff. And you can find me, AST Vintage Space, on Twitter and on Instagram, or by name on Facebooks, and of course, right here, Vintage Space uh, weekly uh, episodes about space history on usually Mondays ish, maybe Tuesdays, and these go up every other Friday. Also available on iTunes, you'll have the link below. Mm -hmm. um, that's about it. So let us know all of your thoughts, of course, in the comment section. Uh, people you want us to try to hunt down, because we have access to all of them, obviously, yes, of and course. things you want us to drink within the not poison category and um, we drink poison if you'll go on Amazon and buy our books so <laughs> <laughs> and if you have Maybe. other questions oh I'm sorry I'm, I'm tired enough that I'm losing my voice and I haven't even been the one talking that's how tired I am if you have questions for Jeff too of course leave them in the comments because we know Jeff and we have access to Jeff and can ask those questions um, so that's it thank you guys for sticking around oh this is awesome thank you guys for <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for the sticking around. Over. We hope you enjoyed it. The we show's are, over. Thank we you. We are done. Everyone, see you.